Turn over to you. Great. Well, we're going to uh, now have some follow-up questions, and I think you could think of this as uh, what will the, I'm sure the president-elect will have some good ones, but um, I, I want all of you here to try to come up with what some of those are or ways in which you could augment uh, the, the advice that the president-elect has already been given. And let me start with a couple, and then we're going to open this up to uh, uh, everyone in the, the room here. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the importance of infrastructure. I think, uh, Governor, you talked about uh, creating the conditions that, that enable uh, the private sector and all of the, the, the uh, expertise and knowledge to be brought to bear more effectively. Um, Larry, you talked about uh, uh, the need for uh, um, better sharing of, uh, uh, to, to, of uh, data and, and uh, information to, to create uh, evidence, and Risa, the, the, the list of performance measures uh, for the healthcare uh, and broader uh, uh, public uh, uh, spending was high on your list. Infrastructure doesn't really seem to grasp at the, the, the it's, not, it's not on the top of the list of, uh, um, of the American public right now. How could we make this a, a more compelling case for investing in things like data sharing and uh, um, a, a research capacity from, from, uh, to, to learn from what's going on in the, in the real world now? Well, I think the issue is better care at, at uh, a cost of being poor. Uh, because that's uh, you know, they're, 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 our health is so personal to all of us. It's the thing that brings people together, and uh, uh, clearly infrastructure doesn't. But the part that does is for being able to provide for ourselves and for our families and for our children health care uh, at a price we can afford. I'll just weigh in with um, conversations that I have with people on this. And when you ask people, what should we do? They often will say, well, we need to spend less money on this at the top of the pyramid and use some of those savings to fund the bottom of the pyramid. And then if you follow up and ask them, well, how are we actually going to do that? What are the structures, the governance structures, the information flows that are going to allow us to do that? Then they get the importance of the infrastructure. And so I think part of it is making the case that this may not seem like the most exciting part, but it is the, the biggest barrier to being able to get the work done. I, uh, Mark, I agree with Risa. I, I think it's so important for us to answer the question, why does it matter to me? I mean, what is the relevance? It's got to be relevant or they don't care. They, they, they understandably wouldn't care. And so the more we can make it relevant, the more we can draw it into their own personal <laughs> circumstances, the more traction I think it's going to get. And I think we have to be persistent. You know, I, I don't think sometimes we're as persistent as we need to be. And the more persistence and the more we can repeat it and the more we can make it relevant, uh, the more successful we're going to be. All of you in one way or another emphasize data sharing and, and developing better information. How can that be made more relevant and, and personal? Uh, so, so we're going through this in a micro way at NIH. Um, we historically support the generation of data we do precious little to make sure that the data are archived, make sure that the data are accessible, reusable, and so forth. Um, so you create use cases, and this is what everybody else has spoken to on a grander you know, scale, of course, um, so that people begin to understand that to squeeze every bit of value out of what we've invested in, in the generation of that data, you really do have to invest in infrastructure. It's boring but so very, very, very important. And it, and it can't be done top down. Um, Governor said it very well. You, you have to do this you know, through a grassroots effort. You have to enable the entire stakeholder community for standards and things of this nature. Other thoughts about uh, data sharing? Now, the, the reality is um, the average patient or average person who doesn't come to a, a place at the National Academy of Medicine, a meeting at the National Academy of Medicine, probably isn't thinking much about data, mm. probably isn't thinking much about any of the infrastructure. They're thinking about how, how does their treatment, is, is their treatment provided? How do they feel when they go? And, and so I think it, it, it's probably not, um, it, 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 it is not, um, for that's not the subject. The subject is how do we create enough uh, national agreement 
to move forward among policymakers to deliver that because there's not a political figure in the world who won't who won't promise uh, lower co a better care at lower costs. Uh, and our task here is to help figure out how whoever it is that's elected can deliver on that. That is a challenging one, and to add to the challenges, uh, you all emphasize the importance, and the National Academy reports have emphasized the importance of social service programs, community health programs to complement uh, health care spending. Uh, to, to, it's another part of the infrastructure mm -hmm. to get to better outcomes at a lower cost. Another area that's been hard to get uh, uh, direct funding for, as I showed on that earlier chart, the health care spending going up and spending on those programs <laughs> down, uh, a lot of the payment reforms that are being implemented uh, are encouraging and supporting providers and getting health care providers and getting more involved in community and social services. So uh, investing in helping a family find a, uh, safe housing or getting an air conditioner to prevent uh, emergency room visits and the like. Is that the right model for, for us to go forward on, on community health and social services, uh, to do it via this uh, health care reform effort, or is there a better and more direct way to engage the public on the importance of complementing uh, health care spending with these programs? I think there has to be a far greater integration. And uh, I think it's up to policymakers. And frankly, you know, leaders can make a big difference in creating a better understanding of that importance. We haven't really talked about it. We, you know, you, the, the moonshot has made a lot of news in the last two days with, uh, with the goals and uh, talking about, but you know, that's an illustration of what happens when you showcase something and when you put a goal around it. We need to showcase this and put some goals around it as well. I mean, I'm still uh, flabbergasted in this country. You've got a third of all pregnancies that are, uh, that are uh, uh, not planned and, uh, and, and most of them are teenage pregnancies. How do we deal with that in a more effective way? Well, that's going to take leadership and integration of social and health services way beyond where we are today. Uh, Risa and then Governor? Yeah, I, I think we have some promising models that we can both build on and evaluate further and refine. Uh, health Leads is an example of what started out as a team-based approach that was within the hospital and now is being thought of in a much more comprehensive way, being delivered online and over uh, via telephone. We know that it coordinates care and saves money. So we're beginning to see some models, and they're similar models for geriatric services that are based on team-based care. So I think we do have examples. Um, we, we haven't talked yet about the need to integrate um, behavioral health with the rest of the health care and medical care system, and I think that is a big source of disconnect and also um, funds that could be used much more wisely. Governor? So when I was governor, um, there were, there was a population of, 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 of our citizens that, that used a lot of different human services. And there were families that I knew that had as many as six different caseworkers at any given time, and none of the six knew what the other was doing. I think one of the most interesting things that's happening in health now is that as we begin to move Medicaid into a managed care program in this country, the managed care providers are saying, if we really want to do this well and to be able to contain the costs, we need to have the ability to provide the mental health. health. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to provide employment services. We need to provide child care. We need to be able to deal with transportation. And if you really want us to be able to manage the health spend, you need to give us access to these other spends, and that will begin to integrate it. And so yes. I, I, I say that to go back to make the case that the big change here is the way we're paying. Because it, it, when, there, when, it, when everything was done on a fee-for-service basis, when there were individual siloed budgets and no one had any reason to do anything other than there was no coordination. But now that you put them into one place and give a, a coordinator the requirement and responsibility to do it, they're looking for greater opportunity to collaboratively work with among and between those organizations. And otherwise, it won't happen. So the payment system drives a lot of what we're talking about. 
Right, one more follow-up, uh, and then I see we've got a lot of, uh, I'm sure, good questions and good comments uh, coming from the other participants here. Um, so this is National Academy, so I can't let this go without, at, without uh, raising the topic of support for biomedical research. And uh, we've already talked about the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, some major uh, report uh, uh, today related to that, along with some recommendations for additional funding. Um, while the Vital Directions reports highlighted the importance of further investment in research, it also had a lot of uh, proposals and recommendations related to helping to make the research enterprise work more efficiently and changing, as uh, Larry, as you mentioned, uh, the, the training and, and, and approaches to conducting uh, research. Can this, too, be a, a, a big theme, not just the need for more spending on research, but uh, compelling ways to, to do it differently, to learn more from uh, real-world evidence, to change the way that clinical trials are done and data is shared to perform much more efficiently? And how do we get that into the public uh, mindset? Well, so the, for the short answer, of course, is we certainly hope so. Um, and, and again, as we move more and more towards patient-centric research, patients are our partners. They're not our subjects. Um, as we move more and more towards community-based effort, um, I think we have a, a, a chance to, you know, to pivot in the direction that, that you're you know, you know, s suggesting. In terms of the workforce, which is one of the things that keeps me up at night, so, so, so my generation is going to wear out and disappear not, not too long from now. Um, but the, the type of person that we need for the future isn't going to look anything like me on, on so many different levels. At the very least, we need to plan for and implement effective ways of training a truly interdisciplinary, highly analytical, mathematically-based workforce going forward. And that's not the thing that we emphasize today, certainly not the way I was trained. And if we don't start making those plans now, you know, time is short. Those four years go by very, you know, very quickly. So that, that's what I would emphasize. So Mark, one, one of the um, duties I had while I was Secretary of Health was that I would meet with NIH on a regular basis. Uh, and I would meet with NIH at budget time. And we would always have a conversation about the fact that NIH had, had not had inflationary increases, that we were fighting to keep it uh, uh, funded at, at the level it had been in the past. And uh, it was an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable uh, conversation. Except on one particular occasion, we had a really thoughtful conversation about it where we had this chart that Mark showed, basically the equivalent of it, where I, I said, let me show you where the money has gone that would we would like to be able to put into inflationary increases. And it's in the red area. Mm -hmm. It's in health care. Yeah. If we want to be able to fund basic scientists, mm -hmm. science, we have to be able to move a little money from the red up to the, up to the blue, because that's where basic research gets funded. And so it goes back to how do you bend the cost curve? It goes back to how do you pay for this? Mm -hmm. How do you begin to get better value? Mm -hmm. Because we can use that money. And again, I'll come back. It, it's the payment system that drives this. It allows us to then take money from the red and put back up into the blue where you can fund basic science, which hopefully will come back and be an investment that will reduce the red even more and put even more into the blue. There's a virtuous cycle here if we can just get it going. Yep. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about how to get these key ideas across to the new administration, and I'd very much like to hear comments, suggestions, further questions from all of you. I would ask, there, there are a lot of people who uh, I think have a lot to contribute here, so if you could keep your comments uh, brief, and we'll go back and forth between the lines. Please go ahead. Good. Thank you very much. I'm Bill Kelly from the University of Pennsylvania, and I want to first congratulate all of you for a fantastic job. I mean, You've done such a phenomenal job of putting this together. Thank you. I cannot even imagine how you could pull 100 plus of the phenomenal people you pulled together to do this. I mean, and, and reading through what's been published in the JAMA, just really, uh, really uh, makes me very proud. The question I have uh, that you didn't quite get to yet is what can the NAM do to now execute? 
Uh, I know you're talking around the issue and talking about how we might do this, but as, as all of us know in the audience, uh, execution has not been a big part of what we do. And yet, this is such an important time, such an important program, so well done. How can we get it, get it to really move? And uh, I don't know, Victor, do you want to kick off a response to that? I'll kick it off, but I've got some real experts and the panel who can help us. Uh, first of all, we are, as I said, writing a synthesis paper. The group is saying, with all 18 papers, with those recommendations, how do we distill it down to seven vital directions so it's easy to read, easy to understand, and so in an elevator ride of, say, five minutes, someone can get them all, right? So that's what we're doing. And uh, with Mike McGinnis' help, uh, we, in fact, are in the midst of writing this and trying to pull this together. Uh, second, of course, is make sure that people read it. And this is where we have a great communication shop, but also we have a communications group with Sheila Burke and Tom Dasho and others who's advising us about what the next steps are. As we're looking at it right now, we're thinking about the following. Uh, certainly transition team, certainly the, uh, the Hilt when the Congress, when things settle, maybe in early January, to be sure that we also get that disseminated, and certainly, cert certainly to have engagement discussions with multiple stakeholders. But maybe, Tom, I can turn to you and get some advice. Well, I think Victor's laid it out very well. I, I think the, the, the one thing NAM can do that few others are going to be su as successful doing is take it out of the political realm. Um, you know, we're, we're, so much is seen through the to the prism of politics, and I think NAM can do a very good job of, 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 of demonstrating the, the sort of the nonpartisan nature of a lot of this policy. Uh, I mean, you have a bipartisan panel to, right now, and we're all kind of in agreement. And if we can reflect that as we talk to members of Congress and as we talk to the next president and his or her transition team, I think we're going to be in a lot stronger position to elevate these issues and take them out of this polarized and very confrontational environment that we've experienced now for too long. Risa? I would just add, I think we can take a lesson from the Future of Nursing report. Um, one of the things that was done after that report was to develop an in implementation plan that involved groups around the country. Uh, I think these kinds of very comprehensive uh, initiatives that we're talking about, I would think we want to have a broad group that includes not only policymakers but also people from business and other sectors to work on a, an implementation plan that the uh, academy could stand behind. And as uh, Governor Levitt said, find those few key big gears that, that you can describe uh, compellingly that, that need to be turned to drive uh, a lot of these recommendations. Gil Oman, University of Michigan. I can imagine the president responding to your advice by saying, I highly value your advice. I, of course, read the report. Now level with me. What are the policy landmines I need to be watching out for? <laughs> Senator, Governor, I want to have fun uh, questioning. <laughs> well, I, I think obviously the just the whole debate around the ACA is a policy landmine. Let's just face up, uh, face it. It's 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 it it's going to continue to draw attention. I, I think. The more we can do this outside the realm of ACA per se, uh, the better we're going to be. And that's not going to be easy. But a lot of these issues have to be addressed with or without ACA. So I think that's the first landmine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, the, the, you know, the, the, unfortunately, in the, in the debate around health over the last several years, uh, regrettably, I think truth has just become an option. And, and I think. Another landmine is just the social media and all of the extraordinary allegations and assertions that have no truthful basis. And so I think trying to sort that out and, and trying to find a way to do it. But the best way to navigate the landmines is inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Bringing people together so that you can work together to avoid those landmines. And more dialogue, more communication, a lot more collaboration 
could go a long way to navigating the, nav the, the landmines and, and including people in a way that uh, collectively we could really get something done. My uh, comment would be that this entire debate uh, in this election, uh, and I mean in the broader election, not the presidential election, the, the, in 2012, 2008, the debate over health care is now a decade long um, and longer. It's about the role of government. It's about what the role of government should be in moving this forward. Some people simply don't trust government. Other people simply don't trust markets. And the, the goal has to be to find the blend where we're optimizing the outcome between those two. And the big barrier in my mind is that debate and, and the need to find a uniquely American system that blends the way individual initiative and government initiative uh, can play. Mm -hmm. and thank you. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, I want to thank the panel for being straight people for the comments and question that I have. Um, my name's Charles Nahabedian. Uh, unlike 99% of you, um, I'm an engineer. Um, and I found myself pursuing a healthcare uh, opportunity just these past six years. Uh, what I bring to the table with my team is uh, the experience of developing and introducing new technology at Bell Labs, AT&T, and other places. Uh, so my recommendation to the president would be to pass legislation that's been sitting in Congress for at least five years to streamline the introduction of telehealth. Uh, my company has put together a telehealth infrastructure that on that previous slide you had up there ties into every one of those bullets and desires that you have. And so we can provide outpatient services at points of convenience at very low cost. Points of convenience could be supermarkets, drugstores, universities, senior housing projects, et cetera. Cost is half of what it costs to provide those services at a mini clinic like at CVS. Right. And since we connect by satellite, we can provide those services to the rural area without worrying about broadband cable and equalize healthcare access in the rural communities. And based on the Medicare reimbursement for telehealth, the co-pays could be in the range of $10. And if the infrastructure is subsidized in any way, the co-pay could be zero. So my question to all of you is who can I work with on the panel to help you in what you're trying to do, and you help me in what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think the, the panel and the, the uh, National Academy staff would be happy to hear from you. I, I would say that in addition to fees for telehealth, uh, as the governor emphasized, a lot of the point of moving to paying for value is to give healthcare providers more flexibility in doing whatever's cheapest, best, and most convenient, most effective for patients. And I think that's going to do a lot to, uh, to increase the opportunities for telehealth, too. Is just, and, and, and that's integrated throughout uh, these re the, the report. Uh, next. I'm Godfrey Oakley from the Rollins School of Public Health. And I worry that prevention is getting lost in the health care discussions. Um, and I, I didn't see it in the mission statement of NAM. And I hope that we might remember the words of Bill uh, Dietz this morning when he said, we can't prevent ourselves out of this. That means prevention. Could that be one of the seven? Yeah, absolutely. And Bill uh, did write uh, one of the, uh, the vital direction reports that, that puts that yeah, emphasis on ideas, population health. That's yeah. great. Got it. Um, any comments on uh, prevention? I think you see a lot of head nodding uh, well going with that. Well said. Uh, yes. <clears throat> 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I, my name is Anna Ricklin, uh, representing the American Planning Association. And planners, of course, have been blamed a great deal for a lot of the obesity problems that we have now. And uh, But I think everyone will find that planners are actually one of the most eager groups to help solve the problem and address uh, obesity and, and other unhealthy behaviors that lead to obesity through built environment uh, interventions. And planning is uh, by inherently an interdisciplinary field and planners, uh, you'll notice there's not a department of planning at the federal level. Instead, planners are actually sitting in um, multiple federal agencies. And my question is related to some of your comments, uh, even just now during the Q&A, related to governance, what is the role of government, um, and of course, planners think of infrastructure in a different way, uh, roads and whatnot. Um, at the beginning of the Obama administration, he, uh, someone put together a collaborative of the Department of Transportation, EPA, and HUD, uh, calling it the Office of Sustainable Communities. And I know a number of people wish that HHS was part of that. And my question is, um, in the future, how are we going to address such complex problems as obesity if we are continuing to work in a siloed environment structured through these departments, which of course the money flows down through the states and into even localities, which all replicate that same departmental structure? Uh, and I, I just wonder if you could all comment on the potential future of not having that and having agencies instead working on problems uh, rather than topics. Well, yeah, gov government, right. Um, Governor Levitt al already uh, commented on that. That is part of the theme of the report and uh, some of the work that RISA did for the report, but more importantly for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's emphasis on getting health into all policies is uh, central to this. And well, I think one of the key ways that we can do it is to measure the health impacts of these uh, infrastructure and planning reports and uh, before we put them into, into action. It's a, there's a f very well-developed uh, methodology now for actually measuring health impacts. And I think including that is, is one way uh, that we can try to bridge the uh, divide between the silos and get more effective uh, coordination. Mark, could I comment on this? Yes. I, I think this is a, a vitally important point in that at HHS, I'll just use the, uh, one of the federal departments I'm quite familiar with, the capacity even to move money among lines in HHS is so limited that the capacity to even begin to collaboratively solve problems within the same department is highly restrictive. And that's something that Congress could solve, but there's a political dynamic here because they don't want Congress, the, the departments doing anything they haven't agreed to. Now, having said that about Congress, could I say another, make another observation that might be a bit personal to some of you? I've also observed the same kind of silos among the medical societies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the lack of capacity to, to, to coordinate and collaborate across medical societies and the, on a routine basis, I would have members of different medical societies come and argue why they were the only medical discipline that could perform a certain procedure and they were a lot better than the other medical society. Who do we get? And they, what this was about was about trying to figure out how they could game the fee-for-service system to pay them either more or exclusively. And that's another reason that a lot of this is tied to the payment structure. That everyone has learned to game this structure in a way that benefits them uniquely but not broadly. And this is, a, this is an era of collaboration. This is the new frontier of human productivity. Being able to figure out ways to work together to eliminate the inefficiencies. And we have a system, whether it's silos in the medical community or silos in the government or silos among standards, that that's what's restricting our capacity to dramatically improve the delivery of health care uh, at an affordable cost. Well said. You move over. Thanks. My name is Vivian Lee. I'm from the University of Utah. This, I'm a new member of the NAM, and I just want to say what a wonderful inaugural meeting it's been for all of us who are new, so thank you very much. Um, coming from Utah, I feel like we are experiencing kind of a microcosm of an issue that I believe is uh, potentially a challenge nationally. We have a tremendous legacy of strengths in genomic medicine and precision medicine, identifying the genetic basis for over 35 diseases. 
And at the same time, we have leaders like Secretary Governor Levitt, who are really driving value uh, in healthcare. And it feels like we're at an opportunity, we're at a point in history where we could have precision medicine really driving value in healthcare, that virtuous cycle you were just alluding to before, Mike. Um, and I wonder whether you, the panel can comment on advice that you would give to the next administration on how ensuring that we will be able to do that, holding precision medicine and really our research enterprise to the same that. standards of value that we are our healthcare delivery system in order to ensure that we can get on that virtuous cycle rather than worrying about breaking our health care bank well, further. Victor, you wrote the, the Vital Directions paper. I wrote that paper, that so it. I'll give it a shot. But actually, earlier on, I heard those words, cost effectiveness, cost containment, innovation. I think, in, in fact, precision medicine is the convergence of all those issues because the technology is getting to be amazing. And, uh, you know, the range from sequencing, et cetera, we're truly going to have lots of great information that can predict or to treat specifically a population. The question is, is precision medicine going to increase inequity or is it going to drive down costs and improve equity, right? That depends how we use it. And I think in the paper, we talk a lot about the need to lower the barrier for entry for tests and things maybe treatment that can have long-term impact economically and outcome. And take a closer look at those high-end technology that gives you three months of life extension with very high cost. I think somewhere along the line, we need to kind of calibrate it right between cost and effectiveness. That's not to say that innovation should not, in fact, be paid and reimbursed adequately, if not robustly. But it must be accompanied by evidence that there's great outcome. If, in fact, the evidence is not there or evidence shows it's really of marginal significance, then, in my opinion, those innovations in terms of introduction to market and reimbursement should be looked at very carefully versus, you know, there are no regulations or no framework around those. So more, well, <laughs> I'd like to see all the support for the recommendation. So more, more to come on this too. Um, we've got uh, four more very smart uh, uh, speakers with uh, questions or comments, and maybe about five minutes or so left to go. So I'd like to uh, get through so as many of these as possible. Do George. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm George Tebow uh, the, from the Josiah Macy Foundation. I want to congratulate Victor and Mark for this very ambitious undertaking already executed very well and thank the panelists. I want to add my wish list to uh, what we want to inform the new president and administration about, and that is to understand that we won't have a changed healthcare system unless we change the inputs into it, and that is the education and training of the next generation of health professionals. So they understand what it is to work in teams, they understand what it is to work with communities, they understand what it is to work with data. Uh, I think we need to make a major investment <coughs> in the training of the next generation of health professionals and give the appropriate incentives that that training is appropriate. And then we need to study the outcome of it to know that we have the right mix and distribution by specialty, by profession, and by geography, and invest in the education piece and in the workforce analysis piece, or we aren't, we're going to keep spinning our wheels. But thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank Great you. ideas to uh, make sure we've incorporated. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Art Kellerman, Dean of America's Medical School at the Uniformed Services University of Bethesda. <laughs> um, a lot of folks uh, complain about the cost of the military health system, but our U.S. health care system, as Risa said, three trillion a year, wastes more money than the entire budget of the Department of Defense. We can't remain a great nation spending three trillion a year outgrowing the U.S. economy and not doing better than that. One of the big drivers is technology. And ironically, when you think about it, technology's made our manufacturing more efficient, information services more efficient, retail more efficient, even, God forbid, some days, airlines more efficient. <laughs> but technology always drives healthcare costs higher. And that's because we have set up a regulatory system that only rewards developers that invent something that's more expensive than what it replaces. Might there be bipartisan agreement around looking at the incentives for product development, 
technologies, drugs, devices that would actually reward American ingenuity, free enterprise, to develop technologies that would dramatically lower costs rather than consistently and dramatically raise them. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I, I'm, I I'm can sure break you want to comment over on that, that anytime. <laughs> um, in the system we have today, you are considered in the innovation business. If you have a new chemical or device, an FDA approval, and a CMS billing number, those are the three things that you're con you, in order to be an innovator. I, I would suggest to you that in the future, you will need a new device or a new chemical or a new technology. Uh, you will need CMS billing number and you will need an FDA approval, but you will also need to have a value, yeah. a, a, a value proposition that will demonstrate that if you spend a dollar on this new technology, it will save two in the future. And have, have the ability to actually demonstrate that. That is a new frontier in the, the ability to, 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 in a reliable, scientifically rigorous way, demonstrate what value is and what it isn't. We're not very good at that yet. <coughs> so I think that's the, that is the destination. But we have some things to learn before we can get there. But we're clearly, with, and I'm back to the payment structure again. If we can change the payment structure, we can begin to make that new era of innovation more productive and producing better quality at lower cost. Focus directly on I value. Totally agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. My name is Ruth Lubick. I'm sometimes known as uh, Tenacity Lubick. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm a nurse midwife. Uh, I'm a member of the first class of the Iowan. <laughs> And I've gotten a Landhart Award, and I've gotten a MacArthur Award. And I'm, I'm a New Yorker to begin with, but I'm here in Washington because my professional conscience always bothered me that the worst outcomes in this country were here in the nation's capital. I've been here since 94 and worked on the, the principle of working with the community to find out what they wanted and what they thought. And we've been able, uh, opening a, a center which included childcare, a lot of social supports, and a, a freestanding birth center in Ward 5, which you're welcome to come visit if you'd like. Um, we have reduced preterm birth by two thirds, low birth weight by three quarters, and cesarean section by two thirds. That saved, in, I'm, I'm using 2006 figures because there have been some changes that took place, but the, this, these figures were studied by the Urban Institute, and uh, they have uh, projected that if all Medicaid births, and I'm talking about uh, low-income people, and I'm talking about equity, um, if they were, done on our model, it could save $2 billion a year. But I want to talk to you for just a moment about the um, payment system again, because uh, we have had trouble getting anything near what it cost us to provide the care. And, uh, and so, well, I, I want to be judicious about this. <laughs> um, all right, let, let me just move for a moment to tell you that there are now, the, the first birth center was opened in 1975. There are now 325 operating, and the CMMI is studying the outcomes from using the birth centers, which mostly have been set up for the middle class, who, who want to change in the care system, and uh, to get them to offer their services, services to Medicaid-eligible families. And those data will be out next year, and I, I believe they're quite successful, but I can't really say anything about that. Um, but the, the Medicaid Managed Care Program that took care of us, came out to see us one day and said, uh, what do you charge? And we told them what we charged and they said, we'll give you half. I said, well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that that'll work. You know, it didn't work. And, and uh, so that's another thing that, that we need to look at, I think, look at carefully what 
what innovative services are given in, in the way of uh, support for themselves. I, I also want just to say that uh, Levitzo Mori, uh, Dr. Levitzo Mori has been very helpful to us in providing us support and helping us get going. And, and we have done work in the South Bronx and uh, there I want to explain to you what I think is important with low-income families. We, had, we did a film and a, a woman in her late teens was asked what she thought of the care that she was given there. And the, the, the women are given their own records to look at, they're taught to take their own blood pressures and so forth because it's their health, it's not our health. But she was asked what she thought of her care there. And she said, you know, if you've given birth and midwives give birth, they don't deliver, they give birth. They support women while they give birth. If you've given birth, then you've given life. And if you've given life, you can do anything. You can get a job, and you can go to school, and you can do anything you want as long as you put your mind to it. And I want you to consider that when you're looking at your strategic planning, because it is a trust that's built between the providers, the nurse midwives, and the families in care. So I'll Ruth, be quiet thank, now. Ruth, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Statement. Very eloquent argument for why the kinds of reforms we're talking about are really needed. And the solution isn't to just uh, reduce the prices paid for some of the most uh, effective and innovative models of care. Thank you very much. And last uh, comment. Hi, my name is Toby Smith. I'm here representing the American Academy of Family Physicians. I apologize for um, being between y'all and happy hour, but I have a quick question. Um, Senator Daschle had mentioned that we're kind of um, looking at our healthcare system, what I think is upside down, putting most of our resources in the top part. And what needs to be done is at the bottom of the pyramid with wellness, social services, and primary care. Um, as a family doctor in the American Academy of Physicians, we've known that for a long time because we know that access to primary care um, decreases costs, improves quality, and can address many of the health disparities that we talked about. The problem is we have a shortage of primary care providers. Um, we have a lot of our medical students that are going into that top part of the pyramid, which while I disagree with your use of the word, the more sophisticated part, um, and is certainly the more expensive, more narrow spectrum, and least accessible part. So what are your um, recommendations for maybe this administration or the things that need to be most looked at urgently so that we can address this primary care shortage? Well, just uh, I, I agree with you. I think uh, that's, I could use other words to define the top of the pyramid, but I, in a crass answer, I would say follow the money. Unfortunately, if you follow the money today, it goes to the top of the pyramid uh, for providers as well as for technology, and I think Mike said it so well just a moment ago. We, we've got to find ways with which to redirect the resources, and that begins in medical school. It, it's, it's giving primary care students the opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to know that there's going to be uh, support there once they get their education, and I think we have to uh, put far more emphasis in public policy to coordinating our effort to the bottom of the pyramid. And part of that is, is reimbursement. Part of that is, is, uh, is, is the encouragement that physicians ought to get in medical school that, frankly, I don't think we're getting today. So I think that's really, uh, we have to create a new environment that is far more conducive to wellness and primary care. And that doesn't come easy, but that redirection of resources is where we have to, where, where we have to start. And Risa? Now, I would just add one thing. I think we're going to need to make it easier for primary care physicians and other providers to collaborate across disciplines and, um, and professions so that they can work in teams and not feel as if they've got to carry the whole burden of providing comprehensive care, which clearly requires other disciplines as well. And the, the reports do emphasize in several places the importance of shifting more resources into primary care-led teams. I would say coming going along with that, though, is uh, also more accountability for primary care providers as part of teams being more comfortable with taking on not just getting the care right uh, uh, in the offices, but, but in taking on some of these broader, challenging uh, social and health system-wide uh, issues that we've talked about today. And uh, Governor Levitt has a 
paper around the challenges that many healthcare providers have, and this is hard to do, and uh, just don't know how to do it. So better evidence and working with groups like yours on on helping to show uh, show the way, I think, is an important part of this too. Well, uh, Victor, I, oh. um, I want to thank everyone. It's, I think we've got a pr the makings of a pretty good uh, presidential briefing. Absolutely. Briefing. Well, you know, uh, your input is means so much to us, and uh, we're going to write this into this paper with many of your points that you actually have raised. I'm just so optimistic, actually, at the end of today in thinking that we actually bipartisan, same page, we all want to do the right thing. And I, uh, I have so many people to thank. I'll just say thank you all. And uh, we have a reception going out there to, uh, to have a little chance to even further discussion. And uh, it's been a wonderful day, so thank you.